special faith journal forum where we're taping on location with Dr. Subramanian Swami, who is an expert in economy. Also, he's a member of the uh, Janata Party. He's the president of the Janata Party in India, former cabinet member in India, and also the author of the book, Hindus Under Siege. We're going to have a discussion about Hinduism, India, relations with China, and other wide-ranging issues related to the great subcontinent. Welcome, Dr. Swami. Thank you very much. My first question for you relates to the subject that we, sit, we tend to see the most here in, in the West, and that is the matter of the caste system, the reverberations of the caste system in India. Could you describe for me where we stand with relation to the caste system? Well, the caste system uh, was originally not designed as a uh, mutually antagonistic uh, groupings. It was not even connected with birth. It's one of the retrogressions that uh, caste has been connected to birth. It, the sages uh, in their discussion on why the caste system should be created had said that there were four sources of power in a society, uh, knowledge, wealth, um, wealth uh, uh, weapons and uh, land. And this should be uh, not in any one hand, in fact not uh, more than one should be in the hands of one person. Mm -hmm. So therefore if you were uh, a p p pursued knowledge, and you are a seller of knowledge or you are a teacher of knowledge, then you shouldn't have any wealth, you shouldn't have any weapons, you shouldn't have any land. And the society should give you donations so that you could live. And that's how our preachers and our sannyasis, our religious preceptors, etc., they lived in society, taught people, but their donations came from the public. If you were uh, owner of the weapons, uh, then you were the king, but uh, you couldn't make policy. For policy, you had to go with people and knowledge. And same thing with uh, wealth and land. So now, this connection has to break. Now, what you are asking a question is, what about today? Yes. Uh, today, uh, they, it is melting. The caste divisions are melting. They are inter-caste marriages. But the most significant development that has taken place in the last three months is the fact that the two mutually antagonistic uh, castes which grew over the uh, centuries was the so-called untouchable castes or mm -hmm. scheduled castes and the Brahmins, they coalesced together in a political party and gave that party a majority in the biggest, most populous state of the country, the Uttar Pradesh state. And a uh, ex-untouchable caste lady became the chief minister or the or equivalent of a governor. I recall this, but you know, the thing that's, that's interesting is the caste system appears to be embedded in spite of legislation. You cannot legislate people's emotions. You cannot legislate the way people think. Do you really believe the caste system is, is going? It is melting, yes. Uh, the only place where they feel, where people feel very strongly about castes are two. One, when it comes to elections, and two, when it comes to marriages. In other places, you can f uh, see here and there bigoted people uh, acting on the basis of caste. But I think in the urban centers, there's hardly any. In the rural areas, uh, we now find teachers who don't belong to the Brahmin caste. There are others from other castes. They're getting appointed by central legislation. And naturally, therefore, the melting process is, is, is going on. How fast it will go towards the end, I can't say, but it's quite clear that caste has become irrelevant. You know, you've written this book, Hindus Under Siege, and we tend in the West to think of the caste system as being endemic to the, to the Hindu religion. Yes. Explain that first, please. Well, first of all, it was not, it's not, we, our religious scriptures are <coughs> divided into two parts. One, which is revealed knowledge, which you can't uh, amend. And the Vedas come in that. Uh, then there is something called, um, uh, ordained by priests, which is called Shruti, uh, Smriti literature which can be amended from time to commentary. time. Commentary. Uh, it's not commentary, it's uh, codes, you know, mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, when a girl should get married, what, what should be the boy's responsibility, okay. what the parent's responsibility. All these codes are part of the smritis and the smriti can be amended and uh, much of all this uh, business of caste is in the sh uh, smriti. So therefore there is no religious sanction that caste should remain. It okay. just happens to be convenient, certainly convenient for politicians because then you don't have to say, I built you a road and I built you a dam or I brought you electric power. 
you say I'm your caste man. If I get uh, defeated, then somebody else's caste man will become the re oh. representative. Uh, so a different form of social stratification. Yeah. But one of the things that we've followed on this particular TV program over the years is news of people converting to Buddhism or Christianity, um, rather large scale conversions. Why does that take place? And we understood that was to escape uh, the, stri the strictures of a caste system. I don't agree that the uh, conversions are large scale. Even today, the Buddhist population has not crossed uh, one percent. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, if anybody converts to Buddhism, a Hindu will not feel upset because of the fact that uh, Buddha was a great son of, uh, of, uh, of the Hindu. He was the uh, incarnation of Vishnu and all that he pre preached was a reform of Hinduism, which most of us accept today. Uh, that's not a problem. The, the, uh, the problem arises out of the fact that there are still people who uh, are th who think that uh, uh, Hinduism should be practiced in a certain obscurantist way and that creates a problem. The second thing is that Buddhists, uh, if you convert to Buddhism, then the privileges that the scheduled castes get uh, as Hindus will be also extended to them. Yes. So therefore, they don't lose anything. At the same time, they can say we are not part of the Hindu uh, social stratification. But some states have actually enacted legislation that prevents conversion. Why? Uh, they don't. Uh, there's no state which has enacted <coughs> legislation which has uh, which prevents conversion. But uh, there are legislations, and surprisingly, in Congress rule states began the process. And the latest one is also Congress, Congress party, party. Mm -hmm. rule state of Himachal Pradesh, which mm -hmm. is to prevent induced conversion okay, uh, where, uh, where money is involved or caution is involved and uh, uh, but if an individual converts even under the act there is no bar. But it's okay to reconvert back to Hinduism? Uh, well uh, there is no, uh, if somebody says I, my ancestors are Hindus and I want to reconvert you don't need any priest's permission. You just say I'm a Hindu and the, the Hindus don't have a conversion ceremony. Okay. So are people converting to escape the stricture of the caste system? Yes, that the original uh, motivation that uh, led to conversion was partly that. Partly also there was 800 years of Islamic rule and 200 years of British rule which was Christian. And both these uh, definitely made it a, a disadvantage to be a Hindu. And the weakest link in that was those who were the most poor and uh, the most poor therefore uh, converted. But then uh, conversion took place across all, all castes. Even today I meet many Muslims who say that my great grandfather was a Brahmin uh, from uh, this place or that place. He can, uh, the, one of the most famous editors of our newspapers called M.J. Akbar. He has written a book called Blood Brothers where he says that I, my uh, grandfather was a, was a Kshatriya, that is the warrior class. Right. Okay, after the break, I want to continue this discussion. Please stay with us. We'll be back soon. After the break, I want to continue this discussion. Please stay with us. We'll be back soon. And try to convert people, then have these quotas how many churches they built, how many people they converted and go back and collect some more. So I think uh, that uh, also the target uh, of conversion is, is the Hindu, is not any other religion. They convert Hindus only and to some extent the uh, Pope also gave that direction uh, when he came to India in 1999 that uh, India, uh, India, uh, India is a country which uh, Christians regard as a legitimate uh, basis, uh, base for conversions and of course uh, one can't blame him for that because Christianity does believe in proselytization, whereas we Hindus don't believe in it. So that's the second dimension, the religious dimension. There's also the dimension of, of the state being not neutral between religions. They, because the Muslims and the Christians vote as on bloc, uh, they tend to pander to them more and uh, target the Hindu community to see that they don't get organized. Uh, for example, the Temples Act. Uh, specifically empowers the government only to take over the administration of Hindu temples, but you cannot take over the administration of the uh, mosques or Muslim mosques or the Christian churches. Uh, this uh, discrimination is there. Uh, religious travelers for uh, Muslims and Christians are subsidized abroad, whereas Hindus are not. So they, they say, then there is a... So why is this occurring? 
I, I have to. Ask, why is this occurring? The, 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 only reason, the only Hindu. reason this is occurring is that the Nehru family has traditionally regarded uh, consolidation of Hindus as a, as a ant antithetical to them. They think that uh, they would uh, uh, rule better with a coalition of minorities. And when you say the Nehru family, it's the people we, we call the Gandhis. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, not, not, uh, not no, Mohandas no Gandhi, but yeah, the people no who took the name. No. name. It's a coincidence in name, yeah. yeah. Nehru and then Indra Gandhi and then their Rajiv, Gandhis, other Gandhis. Yeah, yeah. These, uh, the, the, these people have always regarded their source of power as a coalition of minorities. And uh, these minorities vote 100% as a bloc. Whereas if the Hindus consolidate, uh, they would have a problem. Now there has been, from what I perceive, um, a sort of back to Hinduism movement in, in India in, in the last, oh, I guess, 25, 30 years in particular. What's driving that? Well, the, partly the feeling of uh, uh, this that uh, we Hindus in our own country, uh, which has been traditionally a Hindu country, there was a time when it was 100% Hindu country, uh, are, uh, are second, second class citizens. How's that? How so? Well, this, uh, they, they, you see on temples, the yeah. government can take it over any time, take over all the funds of the temples, not spend it on the temples, but spend it on, uh, on other uh, activities of the government. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the, uh, sometimes the uh, state chief ministers have arrested the Shankaracharya, one of the pontiffs of Hindu religion, on false cases, harassment. Uh, uh, in one state in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India called Andhra, they tried in fact to take over the property of the thing and hand it over to uh, the Christian churches. Well, I want to come back to the Christian yeah. issue uh, yeah. uh, first of all and ask you, um, so what's the problem with Christians attempting to convert there's people? No, there, there, there's no problem with Christians per se. In fact, uh, I myself went to a Christian missionary school. We have great uh, mm -hmm. deep regard and respect for the education. Mm -hmm. We are a country which has always accepted all religions. The Jewish people were persecuted in vast parts of the world, but in yeah, India, yeah. They, we, yeah. we didn't persecute them. And uh, what, we, what we do feel is that this new crop of, um, uh, of, uh, of entrepreneurial Christians who come, entrepreneurial, <laughs> go on. who come there with their jumbo jets and plane and then hold galas and then try to claim that they are converting people, offer people scholarships to study in the West, jobs, employment, uh, so on. It's a kind of induced conversion and mm -hmm. we, we think that's bad. Well, I think some of them have felt, I'm, I'm going to speak for them in a second, yeah, they sure, felt sure, that the sure. strictures of the caste system yeah. have, have, have left a, a, a wide segment of the population thirsting for some form of liberty which they, yeah, the, which they sure. feel they may get if they become sure, Christian. Sure. How do you respond to that? I would respond uh, favorably to that in the sense that it's the responsibility to the Hindus, not only to ban it by acts uh, of the legislation, but also to ensure that you are not vulnerable. I mean, if if you are uh, if you are like a wildebeest in Africa, and you roam in the open fields, uh, you are bound to be attacked by lions. Uh, the same way, uh, if uh, if you have weaknesses in your background, then people will take advantage of it, and they certainly, even if they don't take advantage, they may think that they are doing a God's duty by mm -hmm. liberating them. I have no uh, quarrel with that. I think that we should. Uh, at the same time, it is not only the caste factor. It's not the liberation factor because if it was so, then uh, even today 99% of the scheduled caste or the ex untouchables are still Hindus. They have not converted. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the inducement that your career advancement would take place if uh, you, you go out. For example, I'll give you yeah, today our Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Mr. Balakrishnan. Yes. He's a Hindu. Yes. He's from the ex untouchable caste. And uh, his father converted to Christianity and then reconverted to Hinduism later. So they uh, asked him after his son became the chief justice that well, why did you do that and he said well I wanted a good education and I couldn't afford it but I didn't want to leave Hindu religion so for the sake of meeting the requirements of the Christian schools I converted and when my education was over I reconverted. So uh, I think uh, the, the caste system injustices are uh, not the main part of the conversion activities. It's the main part is motivated by offer of, uh, of heaven uh, once you convert. Salvation. Uh, well, when we come back, what I want to talk about is whether India really is a secular society as it claims. Please stay with us. We'll be back shortly. 
Please stay with us. We'll be back shortly. thought it should have meant, namely that uh, the state will not interfere in religions except of course to maintain public order and uh, will be neutral to who will be in government, uh, who will get promoted, who will get admissions uh, on the question of religion. Uh, uh, certain uh, safeguards have to be provided for the major uh, for the minority because the majority is 83 percent and you know it should not swamp the minorities by majority vote in a mm -hmm. democracy. But unfortunately, the way the Gandhis have practiced, uh, Nehru, <coughs> Nehru Gandhi hyphenated, mm -hmm. have practiced secularism in India has meant basically uh, um, the pandering to minority interests. For example, if a Muslim marries more than uh, one wife, he's permitted under the law because that's, that's what the Sharia allows him. Mm -hmm. he, I think he can marry four times. Oh, really? In yeah. India? In India. Mm -hmm. And if he says simply talak, talak, talak three times, uh, the divorce is instantaneous. I mean, this is totally abhorrent to modern, uh, modern civil law. But Hindus are subject to modern civil law. There is a statute passed by parliament which regulates Hindu marriages, but not uh, Islamic marriages. We say, why should there be two laws in the country? Similarly, uh, in the state of Kashmir, Hindus cannot go and settle down in the state of Kashmir. Uh, and, uh, you know, start businesses there and so on. Because the Jawaharlal Nehru said that the Muslim proportion should not be reduced by uh, people coming from uh, the rest of India uh, to occupy lands there. So there are a lot of uh, discrimination against the Hindus and therefore secularism has got to be discredited. I, I, this is interesting because in a nation that is, well, the homeland for at least four faiths, I think Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, and is a homeland to the Zoroastrians and other religions, yes. uh, it strikes me as the challenges are immense anyway because the polyglot nation. You, you are, you're in government. You've been the president of political party since 1990. What are the challenges that face you? The only challenge that faces me are two extremes. One is I shouldn't allow the sentiment to... to uh, to snowball into a fascist uh, uh, suppression of minorities. Okay. And this happened in Germany when, uh, when people uh, didn't articulate nationalism properly and mm -hmm. a corporal came and totally distorted the future of Ger uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody, if there is a vacuum, somebody is going to fill it. And there is a vacuum today on an enlightened view of Hinduism. They want an Hindu identity, they want an Indian identity which, has, which is in synchronization with, uh, with Hindu identity. That, th those urges are there, somebody has to do racial, so, racial politics. It's not racial, there's nothing racial about India. The DNA uh, science research has now shown that we are all the same people. Right. We didn't come from anywhere abroad, all we right. are all indigenous to India. Uh, but this is the one extreme. The other extreme is uh, that without a well-defined Hindu uh, in Indian identity, we will not be able to progress as a nation because we've got 130 million Muslims who are being told that they are transnational. They are not, they are Muslims first and Indians second. Now, we've got to tell them something by which we don't hurt their Who's feelings. Who's telling them this? Oh, the Osama bin Laden is telling okay. them, the Al-Qaeda is telling mm -hmm. them. And they are making inroads, uh, they are making inroads because there's nothing else to challenge that concept. Yeah. And we have to do that and we have to define an Indian identity where Muslim has to place Indian interests above even their religious interests. Now, as I understand it, there's a system of reservations or quotas for hiring and, and, and placement in certain, in certain positions, uh, applying for school, etc. Is that working? Well, as far as reservations is concerned, the part that's not working is the proposal to reserve say, uh, quotas, uh, provide quotas for Muslims and Christians. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, uh, other castes besides the ex-untouchables. As far as the ex-untouchables is concerned, there's unanimity that these people have suffered imposed uh, uh, disabilities. These disabilities that they have today are not something they have acquired by lack of concern for education, whatever. This has been imposed on them by the rest of society. Mm -hmm. So we have to compensate for that and that, that there's no, no, no debate on that. Okay. The debate arises whether we should give it to, to uh, other castes also uh, and uh, Christians and Muslims merely because they are poor. Uh, because the uh, poverty becomes a concept, then it should also apply for higher castes of India 
who are also equally poor. For instance, the Brahmins are supposed to be caste-wise itself poor. I mean, the Brahmins are amongst the poorest people in India today, uh, even though they still enjoy high social status. Now, there's no reservation for them. So I think the, what is being argued is that to, for a successful reservation or an affirmative action pr program, you, those other castes who have not suffered any imposed uh, disabilities, you provide them scholarships, you provide them good education, uh, you have uh, improve your education system so that everybody can compete. Uh, this form of social engineering such as you have it now, has it worked? It has uh, raised, uh, it has, uh, it will not work if to, uh, uh, it has worked in the sense for the scheduled caste, it has made a lot of difference. A lot of people have come in high places. Well, we have had a president who's from the ex-untouchable caste. We have had now chief justice of the Supreme Court who's from the ex-untouchable caste. Now the chief minister is not only a scheduled caste, but she's also a woman in the state of Uttar Pradesh. So we have uh, uh, so scheduled caste climbing up the social ladders all along the way. Uh, and that's happening, maybe not fast enough, but certainly happening about as fast as the system can bear. Mm -hmm. But the, where it is not uh, working is the attempt to give reservations to these non-imposed, uh, um, uh, you know, disabilities. So, for example, I, I could be a person as a Brahmin and I could, my family could for two or three generations have been disadvantaged economically yeah. and, I'm, and uh, as the, the deck is stacked against me? Yes, it is stacked against you because you can't afford a good school and uh, you can't therefore compete in uh, competitive exams for the IITs and the IIMs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so the question is, the Brahmin says, what have I wrong have I done? I mean, you, that I should be discriminated while the Muslims and Christians have ruled the country for a thousand years together, sequentially, and they, they, they are to get a reservation, but not me. Hmm. Uh, so that's where the tension is arising. Thank you, Dr. Swami. Faith Journal continues after this break. Swami, Faith Journal continues after this break. Welcome, Dr. Swami. Thank you. Uh, the, for, uh, the question I have is on the 60th anniversary of independence, India's independence, the nation is emerging economically. What impact is that having on faith and culture in, in the nation overall? Well, it's um, uh, having uh, two different types of uh, effects. One is a positive one, one is a negative one. And uh, I don't know how it's all going to work out uh, because globalization is moving at breakneck speed. Uh, one, the positive side is that suddenly the uh, rich Indians, well-to-do Indians are feeling the need for how to manage stress and they are increasingly turning to spiritual leaders in India and the spiritual leaders are getting enormous uh, audiences, very large. I mean, you know, we politicians feel jealous of the, the turnout, the people really? coming, not only in the politics, we have to bring people, we have to uh, arrange for their accommodation, uh, the travel and so on. Here, people not only come on their own, but they also pay for listening to these spiritual leaders, yoga teachers. So there's been a tremendous growth of temples, uh, temple revenues, uh, and so on. And as the prosperity has increased, the possibility of a renaissance in the Hinduism, thanks oh, really? to these uh, broad-minded broad -minded, uh, spiritual teachers who have uh, spawned across uh, the, the country. They've also come abroad, some of them, and set up places here. But uh, the negative factor is there were certain glorified institutions which are under threat. Uh, for instance, the family. The family has been a great shock, absor uh, sh uh, shock absorber for the, uh, for the community. We have no uh, social security system in place even today. And the unemployed or the handicapped and so on were always accommodated within the family. And uh, the net result is that this family is being disrupted into nuclear families. We have four, four families, three five families living together in a big place, now being uh, converted into nuclear families. And so naturally this is one aspect. The second is the, uh, the taste revolution that is taking place in the terms of food, in terms of uh, clothing and so on. And uh, that is uh, making people concerned that whether we are losing our roots, we are forgetting our past. And the, uh, the desire to learn uh, Indian languages and so on is going down because English is such a, a premium and uh, we have so much access to learning English. So there are these are some negative aspects. But I think uh, if I go by uh, historical trends of India, the, uh, the way of thinking of a Hindu is so ingrained. 
I think in the end the compromise will be worked out. We will have a modern Hindu who will not have the past obscurantist practices and prejudices and superstitions and at the same time committed to Hindu institutions. And I, I do not say I think globalization may help because we see this abroad too that rich Indians are playing a major role in, uh, in, uh, in, in ensuring that uh, uh, good textbooks are written on Hinduism and so on in modern language. You see the challenge with globalization is how do you maintain your own culture in the face of this, this huge, I guess it's mostly Western, mostly American culture. The Japanese seem to have done a fairly good job at it. How, how is India going to withstand this wave, so to speak? Well, I think the Japanese haven't done a good job. They're you still, uh, they, I think they're still uh, too narrow-minded. They're unable to accept foreigners. Uh, they have a huge demographic problem, uh, and uh, I think maybe I should have qualified "good job" to say <laughs> they've, they've actually put the fortress walls up, is what I should have yeah, said. Yeah, that's okay. right. I, I think uh, Indians that way have a much more open approach, and we can absorb. We have absorbed in the past. We can absorb, and uh, I don't think that uh, the I find, for example, 10 years ago, if there was an Indian marriage, a Hindu marriage, uh, the bridegroom would be dressed in Western clothes, yes. which is Thai clothes, and, and now that's gone. There was 10 years ago, children were calling their mothers and fathers, mummy and daddy, that's gone. Uh, and uh, wearing traditional Indian clothes has now become a thing to do on social occasions. Not in the workplace, but certainly in social cases. So there's a dual process going on. There's That's globalization, right. but at the same time, and you'll have to explain this to me, why are cities like Bombay being renamed Mumbai and, and, and Madras has become Chennai, etc.? What's going on here? Well, in the case of uh, Bombay becoming Mumbai, it's understandable because in the local language, it was always uh, uh, called uh, um, Mumbai. Yeah. And so why should you use it by the anglicized name Fair enough. Uh, Bombay? Uh, but uh, in the case of Chennai, of course, I think it's uh, stupidity because uh, they, uh, Chennai was never the old name for the city of Madras. And that's why the Madras High Court has said, we will continue to be known as Madras High Court. We will not uh, change So our what name. was that about? That was the, the, the party in power uh, had, a, uh, had a phobia about, uh, if they were to go back to the old name, the non-British name of, uh, of then it would have been called Mailapur or, uh, or something else which would have had connotations with Hinduism and the present dispensation in power uh, is, is, is anti-religious. I'm fascinated by your comment earlier about how people of, of means are now returning to faith. Yes. How does that, dem how, what are you seeing? How is that demonstrated? Well, it's happening here too. For instance, I saw in Business Week, which is an American uh, magazine for businessmen, that uh, for stress control, uh, they find the teaching of Bhagavad Gita uh, will help. For instance, the idea that you have freedom in this world, you have freedom as a human being only to do action. But the fruit of that action, how it will come, in what form it will come, is not in your hands. That's in the hand as God says in my hands. I might give you a lousy job and a wonderful wife or a lousy wife and a wonderful uh, job. You know, you, uh, you know I, I'm, you're not going to have everything. So uh, this uh, reduces, this kind of mental outlook reduces, uh, reduces stress. So <coughs> I think the, the philosophy of Hinduism is extremely scientific and appealing. And uh, the, our people find uh, yoga, for instance, as a way of uh, removing many of the ailments that we, we have. Our foods, for example, now the Americans are telling us that Alzheimer has such a disease has such a low incidence in India because of the turmeric that you use in your curry. Right. And that's why uh, your, your Indians are lucky. So, you know, there's a reaffirmation of the faith with the, in fact, through globalization, you find more foreigners coming to India and going to our religious it's institutions. True, the exchange is going the other way. Ayurvedic yeah. medicine, for example. Yeah, that's right, Ayurvedic medicine. So many of the things, and now people are acknowledging that it is we who gave the world decimal and zero and um, algebra and even rocketry. So it's new sense. So pride is also coming with the knowledge of uh, with, with this globalization. After the break, I want to talk some more about that. Please stay with us. We'll be back shortly. After the break, I want to talk some more about that. Please stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Dr. Swami, you're talking to a number of temples and organizations here in Canada. Uh, the state of Hinduism outside of India, does it compare with the state of Hinduism inside of India? 
in some ways it is doing better than uh, the state of Hinduism in, in India because here uh, we have modern minds who have come together and now the literature that they are producing uh, the reinterpretation and the interpretation of our scriptures and so on they are bringing out in glossy books uh, they are doing extremely well uh, in that sense. But the, uh, the globalization question that you raised earlier impacts Indians much more in the, in the, in the West uh, because they you, you go through schools here for Indian children then they come out talking like Americans and behaving like Americans and that uh, is something which suddenly find they find uh, the Indian families find very difficult to cope with uh, the dating system here or the marriages or the sanctity of marriages and the way the parents count in the for their old age etc. Uh, these things uh, are some things which the Indians extremely unhappy. So, they are therefore hoping that we will have religious institutions and be um, become a part of the social life of the Hindus in this country. So, that uh, they can retain some of uh, the good points of, uh, of our religion at the same time participate in the society here. So, I, I think Hinduism here is flourishing and I think the, the fact that uh, the, there is a lot of effort being made to build magnificent temples here yes. uh, is having tremendous profound impact in India. People are proud of uh, the, uh, the structures that have come up here. Of course, we are extremely also happy that the West is tolerant uh, uh, for this and it is shown a great deal. We, we cannot build for example, temples in, uh, in uh, Middle East, you, no, uh, you cannot even not celebrate. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, in Saudi Arabia you cannot even celebrate your festivals, you, even if you do it inside your house and they discover it, uh, you pay heavy punishment. So, I, I think the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this is one angle. The second is many of the Indians came as indentured labor to West Indies, to South Africa and so on and they were so unhappy that the only way they could retain their sanity was to have this uh, hold uh, you know this fanatical uh, attachment to the religion. So, in fact, in some ways the, I find the Guyanese and the Trinidadians and, uh, and the South Africans much more uh, uh, have much more fervor about Hinduism than I do for example and I am impressed by their dedication. In fact, in Trinidad uh, in West in Guyana I think uh, the British would not allow them to build a temple on the uh, main island yes. and they pointed out to, to a small island some uh, kilometer away in the ocean said go and build it there and uh, and then that too when you are uh, off work you can do it by, uh, uh, take you leave and time, do it. Yeah. So, people who uh, held stones in their mouth and swam across and bit by bit they built it and some monument of uh, dedication. I am really impressed uh, with that. The, the manner of worship here in North America I imagine is quite different I mean than, than it would be let us say in no, India. No, no oh, they, they import a a week, we Sundays for example, I think of that. No, uh, I, I, temples people go every day here mm -hmm. whenever they can. There is no hard and fast rule when you have to go, no. there is no mass for example like the Christians have that mm -hmm. you have to be on the Sunday. Hindus there is no, uh, it is a, it's a much more decentralized approach. You can choose the God you want to pray to and uh, you can choose the time of day you want to. But if you do want to become a spiritually evolved person then the discipline is gets stricter. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be a religious person there is no hard and fast. Now, you talked about the fact that in India there was a renewed interest in the fundamentals, the essence of the religion. Yes. Um, over here is that the same or are we still seeing weddings with cakes and white weddings and bridesmaids? Yeah, here there is a little, they are a little defensive on being innovative on, uh, on how to evaluate and interpret uh, religious concepts. So, they are a little more conservative in that sense than uh, uh, in terms of practices than back home. Mm -hmm. Back home we can experiment and uh, we can even have uh, uh, we can have uh, religious ceremonies through the television which will be intolerable here. Oh really? <laughs> well television is, is, a, is a wonderful medium. Yeah. I have to ask you when you mentioned back home yeah. we often hear stories of communal violence. I, c I can't let you go away without asking about this. <laughs> that particular places like Gujarat, the Ayodhya, yeah, uh, yeah, the Ram Temple yeah. and, uh, and Babri Mosque. Yeah. Um, is, is this going to continue or do you think this is, uh, this is uh, come and gone? No, it is uh, going to continue because the basic uh, flaw in our social engineering. Explain. Uh, is being that since 1947 we have defined what is the Indian identity, what are we, 
Uh, for a long time, the Nehru family tried to propagate that we were a nation of warring states and the British put us together. So they may have done other damage, but they, this is a great legacy. Uh, that's not correct. Uh, that doesn't solve problems. It um, actually makes it worse in the sense then it means that uh, you can, if you came together, you can yeah. uh, fall asunder too. And the net result is that uh, uh, today there are 130 million Muslims who are being appealed to by terrorist forces saying that your nationality is secondary, your religion is primary and you have a job to convert uh, the whole of India into Islam. So this, uh, this is one uh, uh, aspect which troubles the Muslim and we have at the same time there are growths in uh, there are Hindu groups who are saying that Muslims are foreigners, you know they got Pakistan, what the hell are they doing yeah, yeah, yeah. here. So, we have to find a way by which the Muslim feels an equal partner in the nation building of the country, the Christian, the na equal partner in the nation building of the country. Yes. Christians, we have much less problem. The problem is only with foreign missionaries. We don't have any other problem with the uh, Christians. So, the Kerala, the, the traditional uh, Christians. Uh, uh, no uh, we have just no problem. I mean, we go to Christian schools, we have just no problems. Uh, I, I myself went to a Christian school, as I said mm -hmm. before. The question, therefore, is this, and I, I have proposed in my book that we should regard India as an ancient nation of Hindus plus those others whose ancestors are Hindus. So that Muslims and Christians can claim equal right uh, to the legacy of India as Hindus can. Mm -hmm. And uh, privately Muslims accept that and Christians of course easily accept that. And because it is a fact that 99.9% .9 of the Christians and Muslims in India are people who converted at some point in history and they didn't come from somewhere else. So they're all Vedic people, so they to speak. They are all indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So they have as much claim to the past of India as we do. And uh, the only problem is that these hardcore uh, mullahs who are in madrasas, uh, they're making it difficult and uh, and uh, they are being, have been that's encouraged. Crept, that's crept into the I Indian Muslim community now too then, are you saying? They're not, they put them on the defensive. You know, they... Because I identify this with other nations, but India, typically, the Muslim community has been fairly tranquil. Been, uh, been, but, you know, we have recent reports of uh, the London bomb, uh, Glasgow thing, yes. where some Indians have uh, participated with the Al-Qaeda. So, we can't be complacent about it. The only way we can prevent uh, and retain the Muslim uh, independence uh, from Al-Qaeda and others is to give them a sense of belonging within the country. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, there will be other groups who will say, you are not really a fully Indian, you are a Muslim after all. You know, uh, and then look what Osama bin Laden is saying, that uh, for all Muslims, Hindus are enemies. Jews and Hindus are yes. enemies. You know, this is be openly propagating that. Okay. So you have to have a counter for that. That's where uh, I feel that this communal question uh, gets out of hand. In Gujarat, what happened is 56 uh, women and children were burnt alive. In, in a, in a railway bo bogey yeah. and uh, this uh, let loose uh, uh, a, a, an anger and I think the government perhaps may have been slow in uh, responding. Uh, some accuse them of being deliberately slow but there is no evidence of that. Um, I, I think I have been a minister, I have controlled some riots. If you, if you move quickly and if the police is itself infected, you move the army. Okay and you can control it. Well, after the break, I want to talk to you about one of your strengths, that is a, the, the relations with China, discussion of Pakistan, and the future of India. Yeah, sure. Please stay with yeah. us. We'll be back. Sure, yeah, sure. Please stay with us. We'll be back. Dr. Swami, we have two giants. We have India and we have China bordering on each other. I know you've written four books about China. What is the future of relations between India and China? Well, it's a, a bit hard to predict, uh, but first, if you go back in history, we have had uh, 2,000 years at least of relations, and only, I think, three years we were really tense. Uh, all the time there were peaceful exchanges. They accepted Buddhism from us, and. Uh, we are family-wise, uh, culture-wise, quite similar. Uh, the, so there's no historical background like in the case of France and Germany mm -hmm. or England and France and so on. There's no history of war between the two countries. The essential problem is that we are sitting at the uh, underbelly of, uh, of China, namely Tibet. And uh, they have another problem on the other side, that is Taiwan. 
So if the Indians and the United States, if India and the United States get together, th this will make China very nervous. That's uh, one uh, aspect which we have to overcome, that is to, to assure China that we will not, uh, in the event of their problems with the United States over Taiwan, we won't uh, tickle them on their belly. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know how we can uh, create that kind of trust. Uh, China on its side has been uh, uh, patronizing uh, uh, Pakistan. In fact, uh, China Pakistan's nuclear program is entirely due to the assistance from China and North Korea. And otherwise, uh, Pakistan would never have been able to do it. Besides, of course, the usual uh, robbery and theft uh, which was done in Europe uh, by J Pakistani scientists. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the promotion of Pakistan by China uh, is also an irritant that we have. But most of all, the China's economic success uh, is on thin ice. That is, uh, their, their entire success is based on the fact that they're able to export such a large amount to the West. Those exports are not Chinese made. They are maybe written ch made in China, but they are semi-processed -proce products. Two thirds of it are semi-processed products from East Asia, which go to China for cheaper labor and get uh, so assembled in China and assembled by little value added and then sent out. So tomorrow if East Asia were to say India is a better place, uh, then that traffic would go via India. Previously it was going directly, but because labor costs have risen in East Asia, they've started going through China. When you say East Asia, you're talking about of, uh, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, uh, Korea uh, Philippines. Uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore. Hong Kong. This is something we don't often hear about. You're an yeah, economist. Yeah, you you have that right. perspective. It's in, my, it's in my, one of my books. Oh, okay. most so uh, so the, the, if that gets diverted, China will collapse because China has a surplus only on its European and American account. Yes. Its account on East Asia, its account uh, of indigenously produced Chinese That's goods is all, all negative. Yeah. And therefore, uh, India represents a potential threat uh, to undermining China. And considering especially because the Western countries have tremendous influence in these East Asian countries. If India and the United States got together, maybe the East Asians might feel Indian democracy, uh, uh, property rights, uh, and the, you know the patents and the intellectual property rights all more favorable. Mm -hmm. If India improves its infrastructure, uh, this trade would definitely get diverted by India. Can we expect a, a continuing rapprochement with Pakistan? Well, if there is a Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say if there is? That's interesting. Well, see, the, the Pakistan failed to develop an identity except in terms of anti-Indian terms. What is Pakistan identity? There, even Ur today... Ur language? No, no, no. There are different languages. There are, uh, there are Sindhi, uh, uh, Sindhi and Pashtuni and uh, okay, Baluchi and... And they, uh, many of them, uh, didn't want to be part of Pakistan. For instance, Baluchistan never wanted to be part of Pakistan. They were forced to be. And uh, India and Pakistan, there was an equation. And suddenly the world has forgotten that equation and started equating India with China. And India has made this tremendous progress in IT. And yes. it has, and it has democracy. I mean, the one thing that Pakistanis, when they speak to me, uh, say they admire about India is that uh, despite all, you have democracy. World's largest yeah. democracy. And we have been functioning as the large, world's largest democracy. And they, they admire that. They, they, they grudge it, but uh, it's there. And it's having an impact in Pakistan. And I don't think Pakistan society is designed institutionally for a democracy. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think the next 100 years holds for India? What will it look like in 100 years, or 20 years for that matter? Well, I can uh, draw on the seven-part series of the Time magazine which says that both India and China were developed countries 20, 200 years ago and they just resumed their position. I think India, China, United States will be the triangle which will decide uh, the future of the world in, in the coming years. India has already overtaken Japan in its GDP measured by purchasing power parity. China is number two and I'm sure that we will overtake China too because China has a financial system problem which they haven't been able to correct and cannot correct because of political reasons. And so I think these three countries will be the dominant countries of the 21st century. Uh, so will India man manage to maintain its Hindu identity with all this? Yes, of course, because the Hindu identity is getting deeper because the, the philosophical aspects which are now being propagated 
is not support the caste system, support the bondage of women, none of that. This now the idiom is totally modern. You go to any preaching in India, in any part where there are, uh, you know, um, 100,000 people say, sitting to hear, it is basically how you can overcome the problems of life and people across all castes sit together. There's no, the Shiru caste have to sit in one corner and the Brahmins have to sit in another well, on that corner. Wonderful note, Dr. Swami, I'd like to say thank you very much, a most fascinating interview. Thank you.